How's it going, Paul? It's uh, just about to get the signal, Josh. Oh, good stuff, mate. Uh, so yeah, keep staying in the wings. <laughs> you just got a ten. You got to got a ten minute intro now instead of a fifteen one. <laughs> I could do with some water, I tell you. Gasp. <laughs> Here we go. Look, I'm looking at the site. It's connecting now, Paul. Is it? Okay. So you know that, I mean, you're going to close it down before you speak, yeah? So that yep. you don't get any echo or anything like that. Yep. How's it going, Paul? It's uh, just about to get a signal with Josh. Oh, what's up, mate? Uh, so, yeah, keep staying okay. in the wings. <laughs> you just got a 10, you got a spare 10 minutes right now. Okay, you guys just let me know when you want me to start speaking. Okay, but I'm going to hear him in the background. You know that, I mean, your clothes are done before you speak, yeah? So, like, yeah. don't get any echo or anything. I'm out My name is Paul Cook, and my company is Planet Planet Biz, and I'm delighted to welcome you to Event Camp Middle East 2014. We're live from GIBTM in Abu Dhabi. We're actually in the Abu Dhabi National Exhibition Center right now, and I'm, surra I'm surrounded by people that, are, uh, that have got uh, their, their exhibition stores and everything else like that going on. We're having a, uh, a little bit of uh, technical challenge right now, but not to worry. Event Camp is all about trying something new, and that's what we're doing here today. We are breaking some new, new barriers, breaking some new grounds, because that's what Event Camp is all about. It's about trying things that are going to make you and your life stand, stand, um, stand out, because we want your events to be a real success. And you might be getting a little bit of um, extra noise in the background, but don't worry too much. Bear with me. And what we want to do is to show some techniques, give some ideas and some advice from speakers that are coming in from across the globe to impart their, their knowledge to you. So they're always experimental. Things can go wrong. Things do go wrong. We do push the barriers a bit. Uh, but that's because we don't really have a, a safe place otherwise for trying out new things that could really impact on you being able to deliver a great event to your clients. So who can put these event camps together? Well, anybody that volunteers, really. And today, we have Martin Shepherdly from Be There Global, who is doing all the web streaming. He's basically taking the content, he's taking this out to you uh, online, and he's also uh, demonstrating this to, to you guys in the audience here. Also, we have the, um, the people from Show Gizmo. We have Josh Dry, Mary-Claire Andrews, who have been um, behind the scenes. They've been working away in um, a, a lot of work, a lot of marketing to make this uh, event successful. And they've also uh, put together a little app. And you can download this app, and you can have that on your device, and that will give you all sorts of great information about Event Camp 2014. So they've been there working, working hard. I've been the, uh, my job has been as a kind of producer, curator, and I'm your online and on off-site host for the next two days. So I'm looking after the speakers that are coming in. And, and that's really it. Apart from, we have some furniture here from Catertainment who have provided bean bags, lanterns, other little um, uh, seats as well to make this a real camp area. But I have to say a big thank you to Newman and Muller who are a German-based company. They've got an office in Dubai and they've been working on the audio visual for the past, well, they worked with us all day yesterday to do the testing and everything, of course, on testing day was fine but it's taken slightly longer to get there this morning, but we've got through those technical hitches now. So we are on track. What we have, GIBTM team, uh, they've invited us back for a second year. We did Event Camp Middle East 2013 here last year, and they said, okay, come back, and we'll put you in a space, and let's really see, see what we can do this time around. So they've been fantastic. Uh, Abby Cannons, plus the marketing team, plus all the people behind the scenes at, at um, Reed that have really made this happen and provide this fantastic uh, venue for us. So, 
that's the team that's involved in this year's event camp. So where did they start? They started in 2009, in February of that year in New York. And basically what happened, a group of people got together, there were about 20 people, they decided that they wanted to try some different things. So they, they just basically had a meeting and it, it moved on from there. But it wasn't a normal meeting, they were trying out new things. And in 2010, there were another two event camps. And then in 2011, we actually held one in, uh, in Europe, in, in England. And I co-produced that with uh, Janice Fryatt, Lindsay Rosenthal and Rui Jansen who were fundamental to the success of that event camp. And it was from there that I was asked if I would do anything in uh, what I speak in Australia. And I said, yeah, of course I'll speak in Australia, thinking I was going to be flown over and they were going to do all of those nice things of putting you up, because I have family out there and I decided, why not? Let's do it. But I was invited to speak, but speak remotely. And that's really what, um, what happened uh, in, in Australia, and then they moved across to, uh, we've also had event camps in Canada, and, um, and also here in the Middle East. So we've had about 10 or 11 of them currently, and they're always a little bit innovative, they're always trying to do some different things, and that's what we're trying to do today here, because over the next two days, there's gonna be one live speaker with me, she's gonna be in tomorrow morning, Dr. Alex Kenyon, and the rest of the time, we have speakers that are going to come in and be on our screens. They're going to be remotely on our screens, so they're coming across the channel by uh, via Skype. And basically, we're going to have them. They're subject matter experts in their fields. We've got a huge array of uh, provocative ideas because we want to stir things up a little bit. Uh, if you disagree with them, that's fine. If you agree, that's not a problem either. But the best way of making the most of this particular event camp is to follow the, use the hashtag, hash ECME13, 14 rather, uh, we are in 2014 after all, and if you use that on Twitter, if you use that for Instagram, then that will pick up your, your tweets and your images, and we have a Facebook page, which is Event Camp Middle East, and you can post up all sorts of things there. So I was saying to you earlier that I'm in Abu Dhabi right now, so outside, we have a glorious blue sky. It's always glorious in this part of the world. It must be in its late 20s, early 30 degrees heat, so it's really nice and warm here. But I'd like to know where you are. Where are you right now? Why don't you just tweet me? Just tell me where you are and join the conversation. So use that hashtag of hash ECME14 and just tell me, where are you? Are you in Canada? Are you in New Zealand? Where are you tuning in to see us from? because we'd like to hear from you. So sharing the, share the love, let people know that Event Camp is going on right now. So if you do that, there is a viewing page and it is bit, so just B-I-T, uh, full stop, then L-Y, and then forward slash event C-M-E 14. And that's where you're gonna see all of the action, all of the tweets, all of the social media that's going on. And I've also got people in the room. I've got Megan McLeod that's going to be looking after the social media and watching what's going on and responding to your comments. If we don't get to all your comments, don't, you know, please keep sending them in because we're gonna make sure that the speakers uh, respond to you. We're gonna make sure that they, they have a good look at what's going on because obviously the event is today and tomorrow, but we want the conversation to continue long after we've been and gone from, from today. So, uh, I'm just having a quick look at my guide here, my iPad, because uh, hosting for two days, I decided I'd take a little prop. And um, it's very useful. It can keep me engaged with the social media and seeing what's going on there. But also I can remember, as importantly, not to miss anybody out. And I'm getting signs now. This is the sustainable and questioning edition of Event Camp. This is the one where we're bringing these remote speakers from different parts of the globe in, we're not flying them in, they're merely coming in over the, uh, over the technology that we have. And we're gonna start very soon with Josh Dry. And Josh was um, instrumental, he's been instrumental in a number of event camps. Uh, one in Australia, uh, one in, well, two in the Middle East, and another one that we did in the Middle East together last year. So he's gonna come in remotely. 
And one of the reasons that I asked him to, to talk to us this morning was really when he asked me to speak, he said, I'm not going to fly you out. In fact, I'm not going to fly any international speakers out because their event camp, they wanted to go for a sustainability qualification, uh, a certification rather. And so I want Josh just to uh, tell us a little bit about that and also where event apps fit into that whole sustainable um, landscape as well because you don't need to print out pages and pages of documents if you've got them on your device. So Josh, I'm going to come to you now. I'm getting a, a signal that you're good and you're ready for us. So if that's right, then I'm going to disappear to the back of the room. But in the, me in the meantime, keep sending your, your tweets and everything in. And I will be back to ask Josh some questions uh, after, he's, uh, after he's spoken. If he does go on too long, I will interrupt him and he knows that. So welcome, Josh. Uh, uh, he should be appearing on our screen any second now. Uh, and he is about to be pushed through into the room. And Hello, Paul. we are almost there. Are we almost there? Yes, he's going to come through. Is he here? Hello, Paul. Would you like to share your screen, Josh? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sharing my screen now. Sharing your screen? Yep. Okay, so we're just, uh, let's just keep, uh, keep an eye on the finger here and see what's happening. Uh, I'm sure he will be in in a moment. I can see him in the bottom corner. I know he's there because I've spoken to him only a few moments ago. And he's waving at me. Uh, I don't know. The online guys, uh, we will be hello, there. Hello. Right, okay. So we can, we can hear you in the room. All we need to do now is to be able to see you. And then we are off to a flashing start. Just to give you some background, Josh is actually nine hours in front of Abu Dhabi time right now. So for him, it's evening over in, um, over in New Zealand. And he is in New Zealand. So uh, we're almost there, but you're not quite on the big screen yet. So, OK, so can you show your PowerPoints, Josh, for us? That would be really cool. We may not yeah, be able sure. to see you, but why don't you just right. uh, plug in your PowerPoints? And, uh, and then we, we oh, there you go. That is fantastic. Josh Dry at showgizmo.com. That's his uh, contact information. Josh, over to you then. Hello, everybody. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Um, obviously, for the, such a kind uh, introduction there. Hello to everybody uh, in the room at GIBTM and to hopefully hundreds of people we have online today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. These events are for you, as Paul has described. So, three things we really want you to take note of today, and Paul's already covered over those. And one is the stream you're watching on right now. Uh, wherever you are in the world, as Paul's mentioned, please pass on that stream, post it into some channels, let people know that you are watching a, a free hybrid event for the events industry today. Uh, the second one is that hashtag, so ECME14, allow you to connect with us. Uh, please post them to there. Have any questions for myself, and I'll get those answered as soon as possible. The third thing there was the, the event app. So show Gizmo, uh, we're a New Zealand-based event apps company. Uh, we've been around for four years, and we've run over 400 events around the world. Um, we've put it in play today as part of our, our sponsorship of the event. So please do download Show Gizmo. Uh, it's called Show Gizmo. Download to your iPhone or Android, or you can use the mobile web link. If you're watching on the web stream, uh, those links are just down below the, the Twitter feed in there at the moment. So please, um, as we said, this event is for you, uh, created for you. So please get involved and engage as much as you want. Um, the last, last few things I need to say is obviously a huge shout out to Paul Cook of Planet Planet, who's brought everything um, together to make the event today. Martin Shepardley of Be There Global for offering us his uh, streaming technology, which we are utilizing today. And obviously GIVTM to have us back again for a second year. I was lucky enough to be there last year. Um, and again, streaming into you from Wellington, New Zealand, as Paul mentioned. Uh, it's 8 p.m., just past 8 p.m. on Monday night. Um, coming to you from there. So again, um, you'll hear me mention why I love such events and that that is obviously a crux of why I like doing such things as this. Uh, what are our event camps? Obviously, we're going to give a quick gloss over this. Um, to me, it's the sharing of content. We hear content is king so much in this industry, uh, but it really is in event camps. We leverage off the speakers. You're going to hear from 11 amazing speakers over the course of these two days. Uh, all experts in their field, all giving up their time for free, sharing the information that they've gathered, um, latest trends, technologies, insights into our industry 
providing them free for us. Uh, that to me is the crux. It's the people involved in, in presenting towards um, the, the audience. That photo that we've got over there on the right, uh, that's Rude Jansen coming in from Switzerland. Um, on the right are his slides. That big screen over on the left is, is a Twitter wall streaming live into the crowd there in Bahrain. Um, as you can tell, we've got a lot on play. We're, we're, we're streaming Rude and filming that and putting that online. He's coming in from Switzerland into Abu Dhabi and everybody uh, in, in that room is watching all, this, all the tweets coming from around the world. Um, so what does that do? Well, it allows you to attend from anywhere, it allows you to attend from, attend from anywhere and speak from anywhere. So that's the crux of a hybrid event, allowing people to come in, come out. Um, the sustainability, which I'll touch on, it's second to none. It can't really be beaten. So that's, again, why we love these events. Um, and look, any sponsor and organisers can make them happen. As Paul already, already said, uh, Event Camp spun off a hashtag, Event Prof, so Event Professionals on Twitter. Uh, they got together once a week talking about what was going on in the sea trends, technologies. They then decided, let's run an event. So they, they came up with the first one, as Paul mentioned, in 2009, uh, and everything was really snowballed from there. Well, why do I love hybrid events? Why do I you know, give up my time like Paul has and Martin has and a few others to, to create such things? Um, look, I'm currently in Wellington, 8pm um, on a Monday night, as I've already mentioned. Um, and that, to me, is, is the crux of it, where I can be streamed into an event halfway around the world. Um, there's no extensive costs. Well, for event camps, there isn't. Uh, for hybrid events, there is. Um, and I'm sure Martin can give you some insight into that. What I mean by no extensive cost is everything's sponsored um, for, for event camp. So on the right there, you can see some photos from event camp down under. Uh, that was in Sydney in 2012. Up the top is the first time I actually met Paul Cook. And that's him streaming in from the UK up behind myself, uh, Steve McAvee Touches and Danny Corcoran of, of GPJ. Down the bottom is, is our tech team. Uh, that's AV1 and, and Streamgate, uh, who we use for event camp down under. Obviously, there's a lot of kit involved, um, so obviously getting it sponsored is, is crucial for us. Not being able to have a budget for any of these events or selling um, tickets, and that comes to my next point with inclusive and interactive. Um, we're inclusive. We're allowing anybody around the world to join us today. Uh, we've spoken with Martin, and we could have hundreds of thousands of people. It would just be a server mold, which he's assured us is not going to be an issue. So. We can have anybody on here today, um, so it is really inclusive, it is very interactive as we've just said, allowing you to send a question over Twitter or through the event app or through the live web, web stream directly to the speakers. I don't believe it can get any more engaging than that. Um, on the inclusivity as well, Paul and I always have a, a constant discussion about whether we should be charging for online registration. Um, it does happen, people do charge and you may have been charged in the past. Uh, two main reasons why we don't for event camps. One is because we're trying things out. We've always worked with a new supplier. We've always worked with trying to push the boundaries. And as Paul said at the start, we did have a, a feedback, and I think that could have been my problem, so apologies to Paul and Martin out there. We're probably stressing about that. Um, we do have a few problems, and they are just teething. We will get them sorted. But again, for a polished product, um, for not having a, such a polished product, we can't really feel like we should charge for that. The second thing is just because we want the reach to be so superb, we want everybody to be able to jump on and have a look at what an event camp is, that's another reason we don't charge. Uh, lastly, why I love it is because it is so specific. Um, I'm going to be getting up at it, well, I'm going to stay up tonight and I'll probably be popping up uh, again late tomorrow night just to jump in and watch some of the presentations I want to watch. I know that they're going to be recorded and available later, but I can obviously jump into what I want to see. There's some social media things that I want to catch later on day two tomorrow, so I'll be able to jump in. Um, and what's that relevant content for me. Uh, why are we involved in, in regards to the company, Show Gizmo? Um, as I said, Show Gizmo is a company that builds apps for events. Um, why would we be involved in, in such a thing? Well, one is the positioning that we get. Um, we at Show Gizmo have to keep our finger on the pulse. Um, if we don't, people will build uh, what we should have. We need to know the latest technologies for phones, uh, the latest trends, the latest things that are happening in our industry, uh, keeping our pulse. Um, so a finger on the pulse, sorry, to really know what is driving the industry and if things we should be putting into our apps are available now, why don't we have them? Um, again, it's New Zealand to the world. As I said, we're breaking boundaries from coming in into Abu Dhabi and we have um, a good presence in the Middle East. Megan, who is there live at GRBT and has been selling apps in, in the Middle East for two or three years now. So we do have a good presence there and it's a, it is an industry and market that we like to look after. Uh, bettering the industry, look, I hope everybody is involved. 
uh, in the events industry and I hope that you're in the industry because you want to make it better. Uh, our MD and CEO came up with a plan to reduce printing in the events industry to make handbooks and show guides paperless and digital. We feel they have achieved that but the steps towards a, a fully fledged event app these days are far from that. We began with a printed, a digital show guide, taking away from printing, and now, as I will explain, the apps are going so far along towards being the one tool that you need in an event. Our philosophy, as I said, is to try new things. Try, try, try is one of our, our models that we work from. If our clients had something that they want to put into an event app or they want to trial something, or and we love, love going paperless with our clients. If someone comes to us and says, hey, look, we've been running this conference for 20 years, we now want to go paperless. Those are sort of things that really get us driven to work with them to come up with a great solution. The last point is it's not actually that hard. I'd be interesting to hear uh, Paul's reply on this. The reason I'm saying that is because uh, we aren't running the streaming like Martin is. I think event camps are working a great model if you can uh, pass things on to certain people. Obviously, Paul's run a lot with the program. He knows and has really good speaker connections, so he's taken a lot of that under. I've taken a bit more of a marketing approach as well, and obviously Martin's come on board with the technical, knowing everything AV and streaming that's happening today. So if you can get parties involved, if you can get any money, apart from a zero budget, then I say, hey, look, give it a go. So I'm going to run through a few challenges and successes here. Uh, Paul, I'm sure, will have a few more. Um, these are just a few things that we've, we've done in the past that past event camps that we thought were either positive or negative, and I'll give you some reasons for, for those. Again, we make everything transparent, so there will be a full report on this. There were full reports on all of those, and if anybody does want me to make them available, they are on site, but I can send them to you if you let me know. Event Camp Down Under was our first one. That was in Sydney. Um, we went with a pod for this event, so what a pod means, and some of the hybrid speakers later will probably go into a bit more detail. We have an on-location, like we do here in GIBTM. We had that in Sydney. We then had streamed online to a worldwide audience. But we also had a pod in, in Auckland, in New Zealand. So being a event camp down under, we wanted to have two locations in Australasia. So we had a room set up with in-room attendees, with speakers in the room, and also allowed them to watch the live stream. So that was a pod mentality. We actually haven't gone back to that uh, recently in any of our event camps. And one of the reasons for that is, as you know, it, it's dual location. As soon as you bring a second location, you need to double up on everything that you have. And working with no budget, it's quite hard to do that. So the coffee, the food, uh, the furniture, the AV, the streaming, all needed to be in two places. So although it worked great for us, and we did have a great, uh, great community inside the Auckland pod, it's something that we've, we've decided to take away from the other events. We did have very heavy streaming of tech, um, and I showed you a photo of that earlier. It's a bit bit held back from what we've done in the past as well, uh, but it was great to obviously have that support to know that that's how much tech needs to, needs to be in play to get these things done. The social media concierge, and I'll touch on that again, it was something we, we trialled and ran with been camped down under. Basically it was me, and you'll see a photo later on of myself sitting behind the speakers, like Paul may be doing in the room today, monitoring the social media, and any questions that come in, live feeding those back to the speakers. So we've told our speakers that all uh, questions will be coming in via Twitter and the app, and that if we had any questions that needed to be answered straight away, we would just interrupt that speaker, liaise that question back. So for the people from all around the world, any country, send in a question, have that answered straight away by a speaker, uh, that's engagement that we, we really love and something that we have run with throughout the rest of the camps. Then came uh, Middle East 2012. Um, one of the difficulties is this was held in Bahrain uh, with Megan obviously doing a lot of the sponsorship work there. She's our local Middle Eastern rep uh, and she worked with obtaining those sponsors. So, the reason I put that down as a challenge was because we needed to find local sponsors uh, for this. Be it global, is it obviously a global company? Martin's come from the UK. When we needed to find a streamer in Bahrain, we needed to find a streamer local to stream out of there. So that was just one of our things. So your base location is something you need to be aware of. Uh, Sydney Power Cut is glowing at me in large red, red letters there. Um, it was a very tough thing, the, the morning off, so we were told about an hour before Event Camp Middle East 2012 was about to go live that all of Sydney had had a power cut. Uh, we spoke to Annabelle Stewart of um, Sydney Convention Centre who informed us, which was really great, that Sydney hadn't had a power cut in 14 years, and here we were the hour before we were supposed to go live. So risk management of that, what we did is, because we had great tech and social media in play, I could come into that early session, so I ended up speaking first when we were supposed to be streaming Sydney in, and then we basically moved everybody forward. We cut off 
45 minutes at the end of the day for that, that session. The reason we could do that is because we use the digital means to provide the program, we changed that in the event app, we sent out notifications, we utilised social media. Those were things that helped us make that turn into a success from obviously being rather large for us there. So last year we were at uh, GRBTM, uh, first at a major trade show. Um, that was great for us because we can guarantee some on location things. For those people in the room at GRBTM right now, uh, you are at a trade show, there are toilets, there's food, there's internet, there's AV, there's great furniture around. It, it provides that for, for us coming on the back of the trade show. For those people that aren't there, this is what we did uh, last year and provide a, a nice in room. Having it on the back of a trade show again provides a lot of um, lot of legs. A lot of legs is their marketing channels obviously rather large as well, so it's good to work with them to promote the event uh, together. Last year we also worked with a speaker pull out on the day. Um, not ideal, something that couldn't be um, handled. We had testing done, we had everything sorted. The speaker speaker had to go into a meeting, which they told us was almost life and death, so that was the way it was. Uh, what we did to make up for that is Paul, again through his uh, speaking channels, he was able to bring in Alan Stevens, who I believe is speaking after me as well. So he's a UK event professional who we basically interviewed live on air um, for half an hour about being a hybrid event speaker like I'm doing now. And the things that you need to be aware of, the things that are in play. So that was great. We turned again a heavy risk of a speaker pulling out to into a benefit. And Alan was actually one of the most well received speakers last year. So that was a great, great thing. So what I've referred to again is these good event texts and social media that we've been able to avert heavy risks by using. So having them in play, having an event app, having a, a site and channels where people are and being able to push messages to them over the course of the event really helped us in those situations. I'm further going to go into a bit of event technology here that adds value and I'm not going to talk about the latest fads or gizmos um, for a better word. Um, event technology that adds value. Um, registration, so again it's, it's something that you should see part and parcel with every event, but it's never done as well as it should be. It should be seamless. We at event companies work a lot now um, with big registration systems, so we pull a lot of data uh, from them and, and we see that the information that comes across. For registration, we didn't have it for this event, but it should be again seamless and delicate. It should be one experience, enter your details once and across it goes. Nobody likes to fill in the form. Uh, with event Tech, uh, with sorry, registration systems and event apps, we build APIs now, so they are talking to one another. So as soon as you do enter information in one end, it comes out the other. So look, all I'm saying is if you are organising events, ask your registration company um, if they do plug into any event app companies as well. But lead generation, um, this is something that you see at events. It's a very big at expos and trade shows. When you're given trackers, and a lot of people would have seen those trackers at events. Gone are the days of bringing in any other equipment. It's, it's, it's the time of BYOD, and that it's bringing your own device. Everybody has a smartphone in their pocket. Everybody who's attending conferences these days has either an iPad or some form of tablet. So why not make the lead generation, make the scanning of QR codes, make the scanning of business cards readily accessible for those people. The same with communicating and document sharing. Um, why not do it through the apps? Why not do it with social media channels? You know, fish where the fish are. It would be impossible for us to get um, all the information out to these people by sending handbooks or printed documents. We have to use something like an app. We have to use digital means to communicate to these people. And I just believe that is the way that it's going further and further. Attendee feedback is, is another thing. Um, we Event apps began, as I referred to earlier, they began as a digital show guide. They were a replication of a handbook. What they are now is they're giving two-way communications. So there is that social media channels, there is live polling, session, event surveys, speaker ratings, all those things you can do through Show Gizmo and Test today. However, I think that is where we're going. We're starting to replace live polling handsets and trackers, putting everything onto the mobile and utilising uh, that as the one tool to, to, to roll the event. Live streaming may be at a humanous, tremendous amount. Uh, you can see, as I said, the, the love I have for uh, hybrid events and events that bring in a streaming element. Um, you just need to look at what's taking place today and understand that this is a event technology that, that is adding value. So why bring event technology? Look, you, to achieve your priorities. You can do some great stuff, but when you know is that, that tech, is that social media for you? Everybody wants continued networking. Everybody wants life of the event to 
continue, to have that longer tail at the end, to increase a community, to grow a community. All those sorts of things can be done with good tech and social media. Everybody that's downloaded the event app today, that'll be available for the next 12 months. So what we're doing is allowing that communication to continue. Um, the feedback and reports for speakers, again, that's crucial for speakers. Knowing how they went, please rate me, please give me feedback so I know how good my content was, how good was my delivery. That's making it better for me for next year. Sponsors are the same. Sponsors need to be seen. They're always asking for the latest uh, thing, how they can get on board with, with new sponsorship, be innovative or different. Um, and also what they want to do is associate their brand with a great experience. So if you are bringing in a new tool, if you're bringing in a Twitter wall, if you're bringing in a event app, get some sponsorship. Send out a sponsorship document, get that covered, bring it in, your sponsors will love it. Digital information, again, everyone knows the benefits of digital, shareable, instant and sustainable. I'm touching on sustainability a lot, so I'll try and um, stay off that word quite a bit, but what you understand is that all good, good event tech and all good social media does bring sustainable ele elements towards uh, those aspects of the business. Priorities um, with and benefits for social media. Again, it's keeping that tail running. This is me on, uh, at Event Camp Down Under, having a good laugh there behind Joey and Callaway of Info Salons. Um, we had Tweet Us With, ECDU12. So people were tweeting in and we were responding directly to all the speakers with that. Um, in regards to social media, and look, a lot of people are going to be touching on social media a bit later, what I just want to say is that the channels are open whether you like it or not. Um, so why not be the one that gets in there and creates the official channel? People will be talking about it. Look, we have a lot of clients that say to us, you know, nobody uses Twitter, nobody uses social media, our attendees won't be on it. Whether, you, whether that is true or not, there will be 2 to 5 percent at any event of people that will be utilising Twitter. Um, I read an article earlier today that Australians use smartphones more than they use their TV at home. Um, this, is, this is where we are evolving towards. If you don't open up those channels and open them in an official, strong way, then people will do that themselves. And then you won't know where they are and you won't be able to control that information. I've got two hashtags down there. I'll try and let you figure out the first one. That was when Susan Boyle released an album last year. Uh, the second one is uh, when Margaret Thatcher passed. They, uh, a hashtag was spawned, now Thatcher's dead. Everybody thought it was now that Cher's dead. So poor Cher got a bit of a battering on the internet for a couple of weeks there. But you can just understand that that is the sort of thing that happens if you don't control your own social media. So again, achieving the event objectives as an organiser, well, why do we use it for this? Well, one, we're increasing reach. Everybody's tweeting with ECME14. Everybody who tweets that has the ability for their friends, their followers to see that and join us for life. Um, increasing the engagement, again, you can send a, a message back to me directly and I can have that um, answered at the end of this presentation. We're staying digital, um, we're capturing leads, everybody that obviously jumps on um, to, the, to the app, everybody that tweets us, we get a connection of that, we build a community from that. The last one is just status and kudos as well, so being attached to such events is a great thing. Well, well I'm going to make some predictions now, uh, where we headed, uh, touching on event tech quickly. IPS, and look, I've thrown in some acronyms here just to skew, but if you have a, these will be available. If you don't want to write them down now, they'll be available afterwards. IPS refers to the indoor positioning system. So that is when Google sent around robots to map out our street view. What they're doing now is they're putting that inside convention centres. So very soon mapping technology is going to get a lot stronger for events. RFID, uh, radio frequency identification, allows you to basically tap and go. If you are in Australasia and you've seen the uh, pay as you go, that's what we're referring to. A lot of people thought they were going to be in the iPhone 5, um, unless they were not, but something that would be coming. Uh, AR is augmented reality. Now, um, really interesting stuff. If you, you're that way inclined, do you think augmented reality is something um, that you could be interested in, please check out Kudan. Tom Ono, the owner of Kudan, spoke at camp last year. He's in um, Japan. And if you Google Kudan, you'll see a lot of great examples online. Uh, HUD is a heads up display. I hope everybody listening has heard of Google Glass. If you haven't, please jump on YouTube in the break and look at Google Glass. If you have heard of Google Glass, I refer you to Corning now. Corning is a company that's taking on putting displays directly into screens. Oh. So, Josh, um, yes. I'm just going to ask you right now if you can, uh, can you just switch your screen so that you can make yourself 
uh, the focal point as opposed to the presentation, just so that we can see you on the, uh, the swi switch between the two, if that's possible. Uh, okay, we should probably almost have you in a moment. But great presentation. Uh, I've got a couple of questions around this whole business. Uh, sorry, I'm getting some instruction from the back of the room here. No worries. <laughs> okay, stop your screen sharing and then we'll see you. Sure. Okay, do you want to do that? And then you'll be in yeah. the room with us. Okay, brilliant. So, uh, where's Abby Cannons gone? Abby Cannons. Okay, well, I've got Susanna in, in the back of the room here. They wanted to see you. They, they saw your slides, but they wanted to see you more. So you've got, you've got some really good fans uh, around. And uh, yeah, that was just brilliant. And thanks for all the, uh, the name checks along the way there. I was going to ask you, in terms of the, um, what you're seeing in uh, event apps take off in your part of the world, in Australia and New Zealand, are people now used to the idea that maybe they don't need to carry a big program, a big directory around, or you know, what, what's the rate of adoption where you are currently? Yeah, look, Paul, it, it's something that I like to be becoming a lot faster to the industry. Uh, when I joined the company three years ago, look, I thought we had to move. Like we we're finding that sustainability wave. Um, alas, it hasn't really happened. Um, yes, there are more smartphones. We're riding that wave too, but getting getting into people's heads that they're only using that program. Um, you know, yeah. for a day, they're throwing it in the bin afterwards and they're never going to look at it again. Um, it's, it does take a lot of education. Um, we work with our clients sort of on a per event, a year by year basis. For the first right. event, what we'll do is we'll say, you know, you're paying you know, three grand for an event app, why not reduce your printing by 30%? 30% for your first event is, is pretty standard. Um, then the next year, what you do is you look for probably a 50 percent, 60, 70 percent sure. reduction on printing. Um, you're obviously getting that app sponsored. The, the money you're paying for for the app, you're reducing those costs. Um, Australia has some of the highest adoption of smartphones in the world. Um, we go to events there; they range between 70 to 80 percent of adoption. Wow, New Zealand's okay, just a, like that. That's quite a rate. Yeah, yeah. and it, it, it does. On a second year, so on a second year, it does come down to the industry, what sort of industry you're in, and then the third thing is communications, how, how well you communicate the fact that you have an event. And do you, do you think that there is, a, uh, is, is there some education needed for, um, for event planners to, to basically say to whoever the delegates are, look, we're going to have this app, this is what you need to do to really be uh, aware of it so that people are not scared of it at the outset? Do you think we spend enough time doing that, or do you think we just give devices across to people and expect them to be able to just pick it up? What's your experience? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a really good one. It does take a lot of education. Um, there's a lot of education, and, and look, I, I mean, I do a lot of event concierging, which means that I'm at an event and I'm talking to um, all the, the attendees about how to get the app, how to download. Uh, a lot of the time, I, you are doing general, um, what's my iPhone, you know, password, um, how do I, you know, how do I get to the app store? Have I downloaded an app before? All sorts of questions. That is, you know, learning about the, the device itself. Uh, when it comes to the app, obviously we have a communications timeline that we pass on to our clients, telling them of certain points that they need to hit. Um, but it is, it is one of those things. With any event technology, there is a certain amount of knowledge and education required, and, and, you guys um, and that's we do a lot. Yeah, you're, you're constantly updating, constantly innovating. I know you're doing some great work with the, the beacons right now, so looking forward to those new developments. Um, I'm going to bring this particular part of the session to a close, but people uh, that want to get in contact with you, josh at showgizmo.com is where you're, you're found, and I, I know that you'll be happy to take questions uh, long after today. So yep. you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm getting a nodding head, so that's great. Uh, we're going to let you go now, but we do hope that you're going to stay with us for uh, as much of the next couple of days if you can. Uh, I know that uh, you referenced Alan Stevens earlier um, in your presentation, and he is coming on uh, in about four hours' time. So we've got a little bit of a time to wait for him. But the next lady that's up, Sean McKinley, uh, she's going to be really interesting to to help understand those sustainable and hybrid intersections that we have in our industry that's going on. So uh, whilst we're just getting her teed up, 
Uh, the only way we can do that, Josh, is by sadly waving goodbye to you uh, and dropping the connection so that we can then ring her and get her into this room. But thank you for everything. Thank you to Marie Claire. And Marie Claire, what a great picture of you in the uh, hotel in, um, in <laughs> Australia, in Sydney. That was brilliant. Uh, keep sending those pictures in. That's just fantastic to know where people are coming from. So thanks, Josh. And from all of us here uh, in the, on in the uh, on-site audience, uh, the physical people that are with me in the room, then uh, uh, goodbye and thank you again. And I look forward to our working together on the next event, Camp. Yeah, look, thanks very much, Paul. Um, I had just the last slide to post up there as well. So I'll just post that online to so anybody who is listening. Um, I'll just post my slides into Event Camp Middle East hashtag on Twitter, uh, and also they'll be available beside all the speaker videos when they get loaded up to GIBTM. So yeah, thank you very much, everybody that has been um, logging in around the world. Thank you very much, Martin and Paul, and GIBTM for your work as well. I'll um, be online, and I'll speak to you all soon. Excellent, and keep, keep the tweets coming in. All right, thank you. Thanks, thank Josh, you. and we'll Cheers see thanks. you later. All right, take care. Cheers. So that was, uh, that was Josh Dry from Show Gizmo. He was our first speaker of the nine remote speakers that we've got coming in to Event Camp over the next uh, two days. We are coming to you live from GIBTM in Abu Dhabi. I'm here in Abu Dhabi Exhibition, uh, National Exhibition Center. And you can probably hear there's an announcement going on just over the, just over the wire. Uh, so it proves that we are live and we have a, uh, a physical on-site audience and we've also got you online as well tuning in. So what we'd like you to do is spread the word, spread the messages because we're here, we're trying some different things and we're trying out to see what, it, what events are like with remote speakers coming in and saving a bit uh, for the environment in terms of sustainable development. So our next speaker is uh, being queued up in the wings but where you want to follow us, uh, you, there is a Facebook page, which is uh, Facebook Event Camp Middle East. And you can go on there, post up comments. If you use the hashtag on Twitter or Instagram, it is hash ECME14. So please retweet, share uh, the experience here. And if you do, if you're unable to, miss, uh, to make a session because you have to go and feed the dog or the cat or make some tea, then all of these sessions are being recorded and will be made available long after the event has uh, taken place today. But obviously we want your interaction over the next couple of days because that will be uh, really useful in terms of keeping the conversation going. Uh, I think there's nothing worse than if we have an event, we don't capture the content, but we're still, we don't ask those questions. We have some speakers, they are gonna be provocative in their, um, in their thinking and basically what we want to do is to, to keep going and to really keep the community building. Uh, Event Profs is a, is a fabulous community and without the people that have got such a desire to make change in the industry we wouldn't be able to bring on these event camps. Event camps as you may know are all volunteer led, no one is paid for their, their time or their energy or their, their passion, you can't bottle it and I, th I think that's really important in trying new things for the industry. So right now, I'm here at Abu Dhabi and outside, it is a gorgeous day. Now, I did ask you earlier uh, at the start if you would send in your, uh, your comments, your tweets, and also send me a picture of where, you, where you're coming into us from because that would be really, really good to, to know. I know already that we have Marie Claire Andrews, who's Hi, over everyone. in uh, Sydney. We've just spoken with Josh, who's over in New Zealand, and we, uh, Greg Ruby. Greg Ruby was uh, saying hey. hello from um, from Maryland in Baltimore, so he's over on the east coast of the states. Uh, so you can see that we're spanning hey quite a, a, a time difference here. Hopefully so you can hear me all right. what we're doing is we're we're bringing people from across Looking the globe forward to joining for folks an event at that is completely soon. free to join, but the content is completely so valuable. I mean, trust me, over the next two days, uh, we have some fantastic speakers coming through. And we are just, uh, I'm going to get a signal shortly when, when Shauna is around. Uh, but until then, uh, uh, Shauna is around. Okay, but she can't hear me. So that means that I will sprint to the back of the room 
and I will, we will speak to her through the headset. So I don't really know what's happened there, but what can you do? Uh, you can keep things going. If we're ready, uh, are we ready to push Shauna into the room? Because uh, if we are, then we're good to get in, um, in Abu Dhabi. We've also got one in America, AIBTM, which this year is going to be in Orlando. Brilliant, I've got another nod as well, so that was really cool. Uh, after Orlando, we're going over to, oh, sorry, I've missed out South Africa, which is new this year, new for uh, the guys at RTE. They're putting on a show over in South Africa, which is going to take place in April. Then, then over to the States. Following the States, it's a quick uh, trek across to China and India for CIBTM and India IBTM. See, I've got it now. That's cool. And then we finish at the end of the year in November with EIBTM over in Barcelona, which is the longest of the shows. And uh, what a range. I mean, these guys span all the continents there are. And it's really, it's a great privilege to be here to actually have an event camp in their uh, Middle Eastern show, uh, showcase. So I think I'm getting a signal now from the back of the room. And Shauna, I believe, is about to come live. When I get the, the hand signal from Martin Shepardley, who's doing a fantastic job, by the way. It is no mean feat to be web streaming this, uh, this content out. And the guys from Newman and Muller are doing a fantastic job on the AV as well. So really, really um, grateful. And if we didn't have their assistance, it would, be, uh, it, it would be a little bit more traumatic, shall we say. But Shauna, I think, is good to go. We're, we're, I'm getting the thumbs up. So Shauna McKinley from Canada is coming on live now. And Shauna, yes, I can see you there on the screen. It's fantastic. And I think you can... Can she hear? She can hear me. I can't hear she you can. now, Paul. Can you, you hear can. me all right? No, I don't know. But uh, anyway, I'm going to stop, and then you're going to push Shauna through. I'll see you in a few moments. Hopefully, you can hear me all right. Hello. Hi, Shauna. So we can hear you. Okay, perfect. So Excellent. I'm good to go. I wasn't Excellent. sure. So we, <laughs> we, the, the guys managed to resolve those issues that you had earlier. So it's always well, I, a little frustrating where you can't quite know if people are, are they hearing me? Can they see me? That's <laughs> the most important thing. And we could, we could hear you slightly. You couldn't hear us. But uh, after a lot of trial and error, we've got to that point now where we're actually really good to, uh, to go. So you were saying it's cold over in Vancouver. Outside my door, it's uh, 20, 29 degrees plus. So what, what temperature have you got over there in, in Vancouver right now? We've still got some residual of winter here, so we're probably around 5C, I would estimate. Five degrees, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, uh, sorry about painting the blue sky picture, but thank you for coming <laughs> in this morning. Uh, what I asked Shauna to do was to talk about where the sustainable and hybrid event intersections are. Because one of my feelings was that maybe we put hybrid events in a, in a category, maybe we put sustainable events in another category, maybe they should be meeting more often. Uh, and Shauna's already done some work on the impact of this particular event, because this, this event with nine remote speakers not being flown in, not being housed or any of those things is already saving not a carbon toe print, but more of a carbon couple of feet, really. So mm -hmm. thanks for the work that you've done on that already. And I'm really looking forward to your comments on, um, on where you see those intersections and, and how we might envelop that in our thinking for the event planning world. So I'm going to leave you to your presentation now, and I'll be back to ask a few questions and keep an eye on the Twitter stream. Over to you, Sean. Thanks a lot, Paul, and good morning, everyone. I hope it's getting off to a good start at GIBTM. Um, as Paul said, it's a little chilly over here, and we're actually just getting ready to head to bed on the west coast of Canada, but I'm not going to complain because I saw on the Twitter stream that Greg Ruby is out there watching, and I think it's probably about 3 or 4 in the morning his time, so at least I get an opportunity to sleep tonight. It looks like he's burning the midnight oil. As uh, Paul indicated, um, my role here today is to talk a little bit about the intersections between hybrid events and sustainability. And for me, it's a real welcome step backwards because in my day job, I work as a sustainability consultant within the event industry. And what that usually means is someone gives me a call, 
a few months, maybe a few weeks, hopefully a little longer before their event, and asks me, how can I reduce my environmental footprint? How can I do social good at my event? How can I make people want to be inspired and come back again and again so that I have a sustainable event for myself? And one of the things that often dawns on me is although the stuff we work on to reduce footprints are you know, really good steps to take, if we were able to start earlier in the experience design process, hybrid events really present some exciting solutions when it comes to a lot of the sustainability challenges we have, whether they be environmental, social, economic, or around attendee engagement. So I wanted to go a little bit beyond some of the event count information and models that Josh just shared with you to talk a bit about what my experience has been and practically looking at the benefits of and some of the challenges of hosting a hybrid event outside of the event camp model. We work with a number of different corporate clients, association clients, and advocacy organizations on their events. And sometimes when you go to implement hybrid events in those practical realities, the situation's a little bit different than when it comes to event camp. So Paul said he'd given me this question of our hybrid events sustainable. I'm going to unpack that in a couple of different ways. I'm going to look at the environmental perspective and the carbon footprint a little bit. Carbon footprints are something that a sustainability geek like me tends to get a little excited about. But I'm also going to look at attendee issues, so things like how hybrid events can really help to make your event more accessible and more inclusive. Josh talked a little bit about that as well. And then I'm also going to touch on the topic of minimizing risk and making our events more resilient so that we can employ tools like technology and hybrid events to make sure that the show always has an opportunity to go on in spite of those curveballs that tend to get thrown our way. So I thought I would start, first of all, with just a little bit of a case study to look at the actual carbon facts when it comes to event footprint. So if you'll just bear with me a second, I'm going to make sure that I can share my screen with you in a couple of slides. Should be coming through very shortly here. So the case study that I'm going to share with you here is of a typical technology trade show. Very common type of event. In this case, we looked at an event that had about 13,600 on-site participants. And for this event, the carbon footprint of all the activities on-site and the carbon footprint of travel to and from was about 12,000 metric tons of carbon. So I know that can be a little bit hard to relate to. To put it in terms folks might more easily understand, that's the emissions equivalent to burning 28,000 barrels of oil. So it's pretty significant. And if you look at that on the individual level, it's about 850 kilograms per person or everyone carrying around two backpacks of, or two barrels of oil in their backpack, if you will, and, and sourcing their energy needs that way. So the impact is pretty significant on site from a carbon perspective. This particular event is really no different than a lot of typical national scale technology trade shows. And actually, it's on the lower end of the average. So they're doing quite a good job at minimizing their on-site footprint. The cool and different thing with this event, though, is that they also have a virtual event component. And in this year, the case study that I'm giving you here, they had 3,300 people take part. And the emissions of that virtual event were about 10 metric tons of carbon, or 23 barrels of oil. So already you can see the very dramatic difference. And on the per participant level, the per participant footprint was about 2.3 kilograms of carbon, or less than 1% of a barrel of oil. So quite dramatically different. Now, for me, I'm interested in the carbon story of our events and the different footprints of different kinds of events. And what we find is that with hybrid events, the carbon footprint intensity can really be reduced overall. But for those folks who aren't, um, don't get as excited about carbon footprints as I do, the basic thing to understand here is that we're getting 24% more participation for this event for 7,550 metric tons of carbon less. And that not only has environmental benefits, but it also has economic benefits as well. And in the case of this event, because I'm sure where people are going is wondering, well, how is on-site attendance impacted? And how do these different attendee groups grow or shrink in size or displace each other? 
And in the case of this event, we've analyzed it for a couple of years, and what we're seeing is that attendance in both environments are actually increasing in the hybrid format as well as in the in-person format. So just one example of the carbon facts of the situation, which also has a bit of footnotes on the economic aspects as well, because of course emissions are an impact of energy use, and energy is a resource that costs all of us and our attendees money. But there's a social component to this as well. So this particular event, just to give you a bit of context, was a registered event. You paid to register in person, and it was free to engage in the virtual component, but you did have to register. In a second example I wanted to share with you here, starts to get at some of the social aspects of whether or not hybrid events are sustainable. And this particular organization that we worked with they made the decision to be very strategic about how they engaged attendees in an invitation-only corporate event. And they looked at who they wanted to invite, and they said, okay, there's certain people that need to be here in person. In this case, C-level executives, sales folks who are looking for business development and sales outcomes. And then they looked at an additional group of people who were really just interested in getting information, expanding their knowledge, and expanding their skill set. And they decided that those two different groups, one was most appropriate to attend in person, the others were more appropriate to attend through an online portal. And they sent out their invitations accordingly and designed two different experiences according to those outcomes that folks were looking to achieve. So in the case of the in-person event and the virtual event, you can also see a bit of the carbon story here on this slide, where we have the in-person event actually much smaller and it's typically around this size, 1,600 people. The carbon footprint, about 2,300 metric tons of carbon, equal to 500 cars driving around for a year, essentially. The virtual event had significantly more people, 5,700 technical specialists, and it emitted about six metric tons of carbon, so equal to one car driving around for a year. And you may be asking, well, were those folks in the virtual environment getting less? And what we actually see is that they weren't necessarily getting less or more, but they were getting what they were looking for out of the event. And I think that's a key point to remember here, is that virtual can have its privileges. And in this case, you see on the slides the online portal where people could engage in this event. And they still had cool, exclusive things that they were doing. They were chatting with executives. There was a bit of gamification, achievements, prizes they could win. And they were also getting the information they were looking for and had the opportunity to socially engage, given some of the chat functionality and some of the social media integration. And although it was a different experience, it was tailor-made to get at the outcomes that they were looking to achieve and have them engaged in this type of event. So I guess what I'm saying is virtual can still have its privileges and it can allow your attendees to get exactly what you're looking for, where you pause and give thought to the outcomes that they're trying to drive towards. Now, those two examples are from the corporate sector. And I thought I would also share with you an example of association realities, because I think at least the clients we've worked with, they've had very different experiences. And they experienced some different benefits. And what I think is really important for associations, because obviously associations are looking to improve member value. and. They want to be able to retain members and engage them sufficiently to make them feel like they're included and they're having their needs met. And what a hybrid event format can do is it can really allow attendees to decide to take part according to their own ability and their own means. And I'm going to give you an example of an association that we've worked with over the last eight years, uh, actually 10 years now. And we're involved in managing their on-site sustainability initiative, but they're also attempting to cultivate an, a hybrid event format for their annual business meeting. This particular association is it's based in the US. They have, in a given year, three to 5,000 people who participate in their event. And they move across the country in a three-year pattern. They go from the east coast of North America to the west coast to a central location. And the reason they do that is because they want to make sure they're accessible to their congregations on a regular basis. But they're finding they have an aging demographic, and they're also finding that, in addition to the aging demographic that's on a fixed income, they have a lot of congregational members, this is a faith-based organization, who have never really been able to engage in the events at all 
because they don't have the means to be able to travel and to be able to participate in person. So this organization is starting really from the ground up. I mean, I know Josh talked a lot about technology adoption and how it's um, really prevalent in certain areas of the world and certain communities, event communities we serve. In the case of this particular organization, they're at the very early stages of just getting people comfortable with owning a smartphone, working a computer, and actually integrating orientation and technologies to their on-site events and to their um, congregational lights so that people can be encouraged to attend the event in alternative formats. And this isn't a format that is just about live streaming. It's a format that is also about active engagement. People don't just want to be receiving information. They want to be interacting with that information. They want to be commenting on important issues that, as you can see in this photo, people are voting on. And they want to be able to embrace their membership right to be able to vote as well. So what I really love about the sustainability benefits of hybrid events for associations is I think it really allows us to be truly inclusive and accessible, which are really core sustainability values. And then the last piece of this puzzle, I mentioned I wanted to talk a little bit about how it helps us to be proactive about risks. And I think one of the first risks we have is ensuring that the medium for our event really reflects the message that we're trying to send. Because this doesn't just impact us as event organizers, but it impacts our sponsors, it impacts our host organizations and the companies that we work for. And it's really important that we show values alignment so that how we host our events are also aligning with other values that companies or associations might have. And I'm going to, again, share with you an example here because I love case studies and examples. And in this one, we have a fellow by the name of Al Gore. I think most people know him or know of him. And he decided a couple of years back he was going to have a little backyard party to raise awareness about the issue of climate change. And Although this Live Earth series that I'm sure most people are familiar with, it was a global concert series to raise awareness on climate change, it was a very inspirational, exciting, momentous event. But one of the unfortunate things that happened was it became a bit of a lightning rod for criticism because people felt that the message wasn't really aligned with the format for the event. And it makes me particularly sad because I know personally a lot of folks who put a lot of time into back of house efforts to appropriately manage this event on site to really reduce its environmental impact. And in spite of that, there was still criticism levied. So I find it really interesting now that this event, if you fast forward now about eight years later, it has now completely evolved into a hybrid event format. And I'm showing you here on the screen the dashboard for the hybrid event climate reality project which, as you can see, now is completely done via a global 24-hour event that's delivered in a hybrid format. And it's really quite exciting because I think it's really shown how this organization has evolved to stay true to its purpose and what it's trying to achieve, but it's really embraced a hybrid format in order to be able to do that. Now, this event, as you can see, it travels across the globe. There are regional um, cities that come up on an hourly basis where they feature panels and different projects that folks can comment on, learn about, share information about. You'll see there's a high degree of social media integration. Folks can check in and chat, but they can also donate and take action, which is really what the proponents of this event are looking um, for you to do. So if, you're, if you do work with advocacy organizations or nonprofits, this hybrid event might be an interesting model for you to look at, because I do think they do quite a good job in matching the medium to their message. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention here, this is a bit more of a personal story, and maybe there's folks that can relate a little bit. We, um, I work for a company called Meet Green, and we service a lot of clients when it comes to their conference needs and their sustainable event needs. And over the last couple of years, our event teams have been They've had a lot of um, near brushes with event cancellations and disruptions to their event as a result of severe weather-related events. Um, we had team members that were impacted by the eruption of the volcano in Iceland a couple of years back. We had a, a client who was hosting an annual conference in downtown Calgary when the entire city went underwater in uh, July and August of last year. And we also had an event team that closed an event 24 hours before Hurricane Sandy hit the East Coast. Now, everyone was safe. Our attendees got in and out okay, and the shows went on. 
But I think what became very alarming to us is we didn't have a response strategy had these events overlapped with our events in a more direct way. And in the case of the Icelandic volcano situation, we were attending other folks' events who didn't have a contingency plan. And as a result, you know, we invested time to go overseas. We lost money when those events weren't able to go ahead. And we've really become aware of our need as a, an event agency, an independent event management company, to really increase the capacity of our staff and to establish partnerships with great providers. Many of the you know, providers that you see here at TIA BTM are probably good partners to pit up for. How can you help us prepare for these kinds of weather-related disasters and curveballs that get thrown our way? So um, I guess when I see folks go th through this, I think, you know, there but for the grace of God go I. And I think that hybrid events are a really good solution for us to plan for these kinds of contingencies. So I've been a little bit brief here, but I hope, Paul, I have time for just one more example. Because, you know, you had asked me the question of our hybrid events sustainable and I think that, you know, yes, they are for various reasons. I think for environmental reasons. I think for economic reasons. I think because they allow you to better service your members or your attendees by providing inclusive, accessible experiences. And by also reducing risk when it comes to social media transparency and critiques around misalignment with values or these kinds of disasters that may, may you know, happen and, and impact your event. But I think the, the one thing that we really need to be mindful of is events still need to be able to solidify human connection. And, and Josh talked a lot about interaction and integration and feedback and, and communication with your attendees across the miles and how important that is. And I think that that will be a critical challenge for hybrid events going forward. I know it's always really hard to try to try and do that. And one of the things that I think is an opportunity for us is to look to sustainability as a theme to be able to hold things together. I think that was the phrase that Josh used, is that we really need to be mindful of what kind of things hold us all together as an event community, whether we're attending in person or whether we're attending remotely. And I think sustainability can be one of those things. And I was involved in a really exciting project at Event Camp Vancouver called Get Your Green On. It was a project that myself and Judy Kucharik of Footprint Management Systems, uh, Quick Mobile, and Tahira and Dean, who spearheaded the Event Camp Vancouver effort, we originated as a way to um, get people engaged in a fun activity to reduce their impact on site, but also engage in mobile app technology and learn about sustainability. And quite simply, the way that it worked, it all worked via the mobile event app. And it encouraged people to take acts of green throughout the event. Some of those acts were very structured, where they could check off every time they'd reuse their water bottle or bought a fair trade coffee, for example. And they would also be able to use check-in codes if they attended a session about sustainability or maybe um, learned about some of the green features of our venue or the benefits of using the mobile app. And then we introduced a bit of a creative component where people could take and upload photos of these random acts of green. And for all of these different actions, people received points. And those with the most points in the remote and the in-person environment got prizes. And of course, actually, the folks in the remote environment, we had about 30 people participating remotely and about 100 people in person. The folks who were remote actually got a pretty significant handicap because they were reducing their carbon footprint by making the decision to attend virtually. And we also had a sponsor come on board who agreed to donate a dollar for each act of green to a local charity. We provided a donation to the BC Cancer Agency. And I think for us, you know, we'd set a goal of 500 acts of green by the end of our event. It was a two-day event. And we had reached that goal by the end of the first evening. And actually, by the end of the two-day event, we had 1,700 acts of green and a quite significant check to be able to write to the BC Cancer Agency. But the cool thing about it was we had incredible engagement around the topic of sustainability. You know, people, I think, want to do good by their fellow human as a natural characteristic. So having a gamified way to do that using technology that could be played in the remote or the in-person environment was a really great way to build community, to promote storytelling, and to encourage people to have fun. 
So if anyone's interested in more information on that, we've got a white paper on the Event Count Vancouver website. I'd be happy to share it with you as well. So think about sustainability as a way to build connection for your events. And maybe I'll leave it there, Paul. I know we were running a little behind, but I'd like to have time for questions if folks have any. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely, Shauna. And we are... Uh, I, I wonder, can you just... Um, can you stop sharing your screen? I can. Yes. You can. Brilliant. Okay, so we've got you... Uh, thank you for that presentation. And you've got some... Uh, I've just been checking the Twitter stream, and you've got some fans... Um, Mary Claire Andrews, uh, she was disappointed to miss the intro that I did for you because uh, she needed a little, uh, a little a break, a gin and tonic <laughs> break, she, she called it. So, uh, um, but she's back with us now, which is great. So uh, really enjoyed uh, your session. And also uh, someone, forgive me for the pronunciation, Kao Hai, uh, over in New Zealand, I believe, uh, they've said sustainability really grabs me as something to care about. Plan well, be elegant, and thoughtful in your execution. So I know that is really your, your bag, so, uh, so that's great there. I was going to ask you, what is the best way of people being able to contact you with any particular questions? I know they can send them in on the Show Gizmo app. That's not a problem. But also, uh, are we okay to give out your uh, email address? Do you mind that? Is yes, that a problem? absolutely. My oversight to not have it... Um on my slides. I've been active in the Twitter stream, so if folks are on Twitter, they can follow me. My handle is S underscore McKinley, and send me a note that way, or please do um, share my email contact information as well. Right, okay. So the best way to get hold of yourself is really to follow you on Twitter, and that achieves two things. One, it, it means that you can decide to, uh, uh, you know, respond to them or not, and also you've got another follower, so that's all cool. Uh, so. Um, yeah, no obligation to follow, just the <laughs> no notice, obligation. Right? <laughs> but the, the work that you're doing, and especially with some of the work that you and I are doing as well, in really looking at how speakers are making a difference in terms of if they can't be flown across the globe, if they, if they don't really need to have the accommodation, then that has a big impact on the environment. And that's really where I think we wanted to go today with, with this particular idea just to provoke some thoughts some people will still say yeah but we need to see the speakers there live we need to have that but maybe we also need to be ready to have this uh, virtual engagement of speakers being able to do what you're doing which is presenting remotely uh, just before yourself we had josh on and he was uh, over in new zealand so he was plus nine hours in uh, in front of us so he's coming to the end of his day you're coming to the sorry he's coming to the end of his day on monday uh you're coming to the end of your sunday or actually you might already be are you early monday morning now what what time are you yeah. now well 1 a.m monday morning just, just before 1 a.m this is dedication isn't it this is real dedication uh in the event profs world to do this and i i know that feeling because when josh asked me to speak at an event camp it was very much uh would i do a time slot yeah no problem I agreed to do three, three o'clock in the morning, I think, was, was when I was mm. getting up. And so, um, so yeah, it does take a, a different way of thinking, I think, that we need to bring into events because it's important. If we can't get the speaker there and we've got the live audience in front of us, then we still need to make sure that we are delivering according to them. And I know that with the Ash Cloud some years ago, there was a MPI um, Poland Congress where five speakers were... I, th I think they were brought in remotely to deliver to the 80 or 90 delegates that happened to be uh, live in the room. So it is one of those uh, measures. And I, I think if we keep the sustainable aspect in mind with hybrid events, then we can take these events through this community into different places. So Shauna, uh, I'm going to say goodbye to you now. And thank you. I do hope you can stay, uh, stay with us over the next uh, one and a half days that we've got of being here at GIBTM. Uh, keep tweeting and I'll, I'll leave you to get off so you can get some rest and, and come back refreshed for the rest of the event. Camp. But thank you for thank having you me for, and hope uh, everyone enjoys, uh, yeah. enjoys, it, enjoys the rest of the event. Camp. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye for now. So that was, uh, that was Sean McKinley all the way from Vancouver in Canada. So our first two speakers, we had Josh Dry from New Zealand. Uh, so we've really spanned the globe in the, in the last hour. We've gone from New Zealand's, uh, who are uh, nine hours in front, to Canada, 
who are several hours behind. And we are right in the middle of the hub here in Abu Dhabi. And we're coming live to you from GIBTM in the Abu Dhabi National Exhibition Center. So what I'd like you to do, as you have been, there are people on the, on the um, Twitter stream, which is fantastic. And still keep you, use that hashtag, hash ECME14. And tell us where you are and what you're doing. Where are you in the world right now? Because that would be good for us to know. And so what we can do is make sure that uh, we can reference you, we can name check you. And I'm just going to uh, preview what's going to come up in a few hours' time. Uh, set your clocks, obviously, to Abu Dhabi time. It's the only time that matters uh, to, uh, to you not missing the start of anything uh, that's going on here. So at 3 o'clock, 3 p.m. Abu Dhabi time, we have uh, Alan Stevens, past president of the Global Speakers Federation, who's going to talk about uh, training your sp speaker virtually. After him, we have Mike Clanton. He's coming in from France, and he's talking about event connectivity and trends. And to finish us off for the day, Kersha Woodgate is going to take that look at online, um, online and hybrid event marketing. What are the secrets? What are the things that you need to be doing to attract the audiences to your event, both if you are holding an event online or whether you are mixing it up and having hybrid and offline experiences as well? So we've got those three speakers coming up today. And just to remind you, if you want to, if you've missed any of what we said of what's been recorded, it will be available um, in a not too distant future, but isn't available right at this moment. So you will be able to see this on demand. But please keep sharing. Please keep going to the Event Camp Middle East um, Facebook page. Pop up your pictures up there. Instagram, if you use that, it's hash ECME14. And my thanks this morning for their sterling work go to uh, Martin Shepard Lee at Be There Global for, the, for arranging the streaming, Newman and Muller for the audio visual, and of course our friends here at GIBTM for uh, still allowing us this uh, fabulous space that we have in this particular venue. So I'm going to close now. I'm going to uh, keep watching the Twitter stream. I'm going to ask you to keep thinking of questions for the speakers that you can see uh, coming up over the next day and a half and send those in. You can send them ahead of time. That's not a problem at all. Uh, the more interaction we have, the better. So please share the love, share the news of Event Camp Middle East 2014. Thank you for now.